Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very good job on my last name. Thank you. <laughs> okay, guys. So uh, let's move forward. Uh, welcome on my presentation, Data Prediction API and Data Prediction API NG. Uh, it's a talk about the crypto platform in Windows. Uh, there was a couple of things that you guys should know about, and that is something that we would like to. That is something that uh, we would like to. Uh, well, do the deep dive into details. Yeah. A uh, couple of words about myself. Um, as you see, Paula J. And uh, what I do, I'm the CEO of uh, Secure. And uh, we've got a pretty nice team uh, spread across four locations, New York, Dubai, Switzerland, and Poland. I'm Polish originally, and that's where I technically live on Saturdays. Uh, but a uh, couple, of, couple of words to mention as well. I do um, perform the penetration tests uh, at our customer sites. Being also a CEO, which is kind of funny, uh, it's, it's uh, tough, but uh, I try to manage the team over 36 people. Uh, we've grown a little bit uh, from the last two years uh, in cybersecurity. If it's about my background as well, I do have access to the source code of Windows, though this part it's not covered by the access to the source code. Yeah? So I do have like to 99.999% and eventually um, that remaining part, it's something that is worth to uh, have a look at uh, regarding the uh, security. So I also uh, happen to speak at the different types of conferences, uh, also uh, Black Hat, for example, or uh, Microsoft Ignite. So all of those, but they always show one simple thing. Uh, it's a very nice opportunity to share and hopefully you will receive this presentation the same way. I'm happy to explain everything that is out there in crypto and Windows. If you will have any questions, let me know. Now, just to give you the background about the subject, because why Data Protection API? Well, basically in 2010 on Black Hat, Jean-Michel and Ali Burstein, they do present it to DP API pick tool to do a little bit around the data protection API. And uh, since 2010, nothing really happened. Yeah? So, or I don't want to say nothing big because maybe that something happened, but nothing really that much significant that could show us how cryptography uh, in Windows works and what's the flow behind it. Yeah? Now, whenever we are thinking about the whole story uh, of uh, how data protection API and evolved and so on, that's the platform that has been there for quite a while. Uh, but uh, the new crypto uh, NG has been introduced within the Windows Server uh, 2012 R2 and 8.1. But that's something that I would also uh, like to talk about in a separate part of the presentation. Yeah? So this is what gives you the background why the subject is out there, why it's important, because you need to know how your secrets are or are not protected, that's for sure. And the second thing, is that uh, within the Data Protection API, uh, our team uh, spent over two years reverse engineering the whole platform and we managed. And eventually all of the tools and everything that we got, we share. So hopefully you will find that useful as well. So uh, before we start, a uh, little story, if you don't mind, uh, related with the Data Protection API research. Uh, I like to travel to different types of locations in the world when there is no mobile range. Uh, that's that's quite rare to spot, but things like Siberia, things like Alaska somewhere out there and so on, these are the places uh, that are basically um, worth having a look at. And uh, when I was in Siberia, I was ordering a breakfast pretty much every day in some different places and so on. And every single time I was asking for like scrambled eggs, I was getting an omelette. Or when I was asking for a sausage, then they were like giving me scrambled eggs. So I was literally never ever having anything that I wanted as a meal. Like, why? But okay, like why doesn't exist over here? So I was like, okay, I open up the menu, another time I'm like, you're already disappointed. Uh, and um, I check out and there is a cheese sandwich. I'm like, perfect. How wrong can you go with a cheese sandwich? So I got this, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, that is pretty um, nice sandwich. Can I please have a ketchup? And do you have a microwave? Yeah, <laughs> then it's a great sandwich. So what I'm saying is that having this in mind, it's kind of interesting to <laughs> get into one simple conclusion that in cryptography, definitely we need to search for quite a long time around what's going on, but there's always a hope 
always, always a hope that you're going to get what you want. And I was pretty much having this hope on my vacation, but that never came actually. But um, in cryptography, finally, you're going to get somewhere. And that's my point. You need to spend a lot of time on the research, but eventually you're going to get somewhere. So uh, whenever we are thinking about the algorithms that are out there for the uh, cryptography, uh, well, there are a couple of ones that we need to know and uh, that Data Protection API is leveraging. And these are things like AS256, CBC, AS256, CCM, etc. That's for particularly BitLocker. But for Data Protection API blobs, we are using GCM. Yes, and that is something that uh, we're going to be focusing on. There's also RSA being used for the keys protection, but within the data protection API and G, it's a little bit different story because you are using a little bit different algorithms, but this is something that I will mention in the moment of how does it work. Yeah? So let me cover at the very beginning what the, what the data protection API is. Uh, in details, and then we're going to get, of course, into techie part. So um, classic data protection API, as we describe it, is the one that is used um, as a crypto platform within Windows. And very oftenly, in order to encrypt data, it leverages three things, password, the data blob, and the entropy. So why we are talking about that? Because every single time within the application, whether if it's Internet Explorer, Edge, or whatever, Firefox, Chrome, you are about to encrypt something and save somewhere, that needs to happen in a certain way. And you've got pretty much two choices. Whether you code it by yourself and save it in your own way, and uh, is this a good way? Maybe it's the best way, who knows? Or you choose the Windows way. And Windows way isn't that bad, but that's why we are here to listen to all of the different types of pros and cons of what's going on. Yeah? So let me have a look uh, into, into more details. So Data Protection API itself, uh, as the way as we have it in Windows in a basic form, it's uh, quite interesting because every single time you store some kind of a secret, let's call it this way, like password to Facebook in a browser, then that particular secret, it's stored as the browser could save it, but it's encrypted in a way how Windows would do it, uh, relying on your password or technically relying on your password's hash. Now, I'm saying this in a very straightforward way. Of course, there are many more details behind it, which we are digging into, but that's just for the simple introduction. So the stronger your password is in general, the more protected your secret's going to be. We could be thinking, OK, what about the offline access? Yeah? Well, that's the beautiful part of that. If you don't use, for example, hibernation and you have or you have an encrypted drive, then basically you are not able to get access to or extract the credentials and get access to a particular particular uh, secrets. Now, just a little bit of an explanation, if you don't mind. And I'm really bad at uh, painting, so forgive me this, but it would be fantastic to explain that in the very, very details of what's going on. Now, we said that the password or secret relies on our password's hash. Now, that's definitely true, but that differs from the local user perspective and the domain user perspective. And that is something that we need to look at. So we've got a, here a local user and here we've got a domain user. Yeah? So these are these two things. Now, whenever we're thinking about secret and secret, yeah, that is something that um, is protected in a different ways. So for the local user, what happens? We have, of course, in a some database, MD4s, so hashes of the user's password. But what is happening is that we have a file, a particular file, and that file is called master key container. And master key container has key. And that particular key oh, is used to encrypt that secret. So question is, how is the key in the master key container protected? And for the local user, that's nothing but the schwa one. Yeah, why like that? Quite logical, because if it's not prone to offline access, if I manage to get access to the SAM database, then I just have MD4, which I have to crack, and then I calculate SHA-1, and then I'm able to get access to the secret. So that's how it's happening. So what we can get into conclusion uh, about that? Well, we could say here that our local secrets for the local users are as secure as our password is. As simple as this. Yeah? Let's leave this. This is actually quite easy. So another part, it's the domain user, and that's cool. So we have over here a master key container as well and within the domain user we have two ways of storing um the confirmation of the identity so to say one thing is going to be md4 which we in ntds.dit on the domain controller but another one it's going to be something that is called msdcc2 and that is a value that we extract from the registry of the local machine 
And that is something that we popularly call cash credentials, but these are not credentials. They, have, they haven't been even standing next to credentials. This is just a pre-calculated value um, that we, when we provide a username and password, there is a function calculated on the top of that, and we compare with this value that is on the registry. Yeah, so quite easy. And based on that, we are able to log on. Yeah. So um, yeah, so that depends on this or on that. So what is the beautiful part over here that our logon depends on the probability on the password uh, if it's correct or not, and on the top of that we've got certain type of a value. It's not this value, by the way, that decrypts or encrypts that key. It's the value that is just used for confirmation. What encrypts or decrypts effectively at the very end, it's nothing but over here, and that's the difference, MD4. Like for the local, we had SHUA1, for this guy, we have MD4. Why like that? Because we have an assurance that MD4 never appears in the computer when the user logs on. Of course, we are not talking Mimika's extracting from, from the memory and, the, and the, all the credentials like that. And we're not talking over here about the hibernation file. We're talking about saving it somewhere in the form of a text that we are able to get access to. And that is beautiful because that MD4 not being anywhere on the users or servers um, area is used to technically, uh, well, in this case, encrypt the key, master key to encrypt the secret. Yeah? So this is the flow. So in every user's profile, we've got master key containers and these containers contain keys that encrypt our secrets. Yeah, to recap. Now, situation is getting a little bit more complex. If we look at the details of this master key container, so what is inside? So we could be thinking, hmm, so if, just a thought, if I'm using the live ID to sign into Windows, where is my hash? Okay, just a thought. I'm not answering this question now. Yeah, but where is my hash? So if we rely on a password hash, then in such a, in such a case, uh, we know that password hash will be the one to decrypt these keys to get access to secrets. So if we do store that in the cloud, question would be, it, who is able to get access to those secrets? And again, I'm not answering that because it's a very dangerous question. Uh, but then, following up, um, who else then, is there any other party that is able to get access to our secrets this way? And answer is, yes, it is. And uh, this is the party number three, that is a very interesting key that is used to encrypt, but it's only in the domain, the master keys of the users that are encrypted with the password hash, there is a, always a second copy of it stored in Windows that is actually encrypted with the public key of the domain. And uh, you might not have heard of that because it's a kind of a, like we were working on it, maybe you've already seen, like we were, when we were conver like having conversations about that interesting type of data, but that is something that you can find out in every user's profile within the domain. And that's a little not cool. So let me uh, share with you a little bit of a presentation of how and where these keys are stored. And we're gonna be discussing that in details. So. Here we go. So this is basically a workstation with, um, from Freddy. And uh, over here, we've got something that is called BK Secure. And that BK Secure, as you see, it's something that, uh, well, it's secure because it's just my company name, but that is something that is actually a public key of the whole domain. Now, every user has the same key. What's the question that should come next? Where's the private one, right? Who has access to the private one? Because it looks like this guy, uh, not even looks like, I will show you. This guy is encrypting our secrets, everything. Like your private keys uh, for the certificates, your whatever passwords, if you store them on the Chrome, Edge, Firefox, same story, uh, anything like password for Outlook, anything that is actually leveraging data protection API. And I'm not saying it's a bad platform, we just need to be absolutely aware of how it works. For example, KeePass is a good example here. So if you rely on KeePass on single sign-on for Windows, then this is really much what we are getting over here. Uh, demos, of course, will come in a moment. So let's move forward. So this is basically where they are. They are within the 
see users, username, uh, update a roaming Microsoft protect and seat of the user and whole list over here uh, you've got. If you want to do uh, someone a bad joke, uh, deleting this folder would be uh, definitely a horrible joke because then this person will not be able to get access to any types of secrets that uh, this person has stored. Uh, pretty funny. Anyway, so let's move forward. <laughs> So whenever we are thinking about this classic data protection API secrets, this is a little bit of a sum up. A sum up. I know it's not a very unfortunate color, but let me uh, enlarge it a little bit and it's gonna be it's gonna be clear. Here we go. So data protection API classic. So you can see that we are here relying MD4 SHUA1 and eventually it depends, of course, how the path goes, but there is or could be a moment where we are relying on the cache log on data. Now, second type of secret, and that is actually quite interesting thing to spot, it's related with uh, something that we call a cred hist, yeah, like here. And within the cred hist, uh, this is another file that is within the same area. That is nothing but the history of our credentials. If you ever wondered how could it be that when I set up within a group policy that I shouldn't repeat the same password for the next 20 times or something, obviously that must be stored somewhere. And that is actually stored within the cred hist file on every user's profile. That file is decryptable with your user's password hash. Yes, yeah, so the moment you change it, basically, uh, you are able to see like, oh, is there any hash that looks similarly? Yeah? And uh, at that moment, um, something, something to mention. So let's guys see of how we are able to get access to the secrets in the uh, well operating systems way. But before we get that, a uh, couple of couple of words for the introduction. Yes, yeah? so cache logons, basically. Uh, why I'm going to leverage this? I would like to show you one thing that um, I'm going to technically perform the following operation. I've got a user, user has stored the password in Chrome. When I log on as a user, I'm able to see this password, not a biggie. By the way, offsite comment, any other application can see that too. So if you save password in Chrome, or I'm just giving Chrome as an example, of course, then any other portable apps or whatever, whatever, literally whatever you're gonna use, will be able to read your password too. Of course, I'm not saying that apps are doing this, but they can without any problem since they run as you. So just don't do that. That's my um, conclusion. But uh, in general, what's the point is that I'm going to leverage cache log on data. I'm going to disconnect myself from the network and then I'm going to update the cache log on data to show you that I'm logging on with a different password so that you can see that data protection API is actually in this particular case prone to password change and uh, I will not be able to get access to the user secrets and then later we'll try to get access to those secrets. Now, if you wondered ever if the cache logon data uh, is a safe mechanism or not, just a few words, uh, in the Windows XP it was already quite nice though um, it was relying on the, that value was called DCC1, it was relying on the MD4 of the username and user's password's hash joined together and on the top of that we calculate the hash. Though with and since Windows Vista there's a couple of changes that were introduced. We, uh, we call this value MSDCC2, as I already mentioned. This is a result of the function PBKDF2, which is originally used for things like keypass, lastpass, vault, etc. Yeah? It's a pretty nice function that is used for encrypting things. Yeah? Uh, now, whenever we are thinking about cracking that, of course it's crackable, it's just going to take a long time, and that's the strength of the solution. So let's dig in into a little bit of a uh, situation where we're going to be, of course, analyzing the cache log on data. So um, let me see, let me see. Here we go. So first of all, well, we've got our user's machine and I'm switching to the virtual machine right now. So that's this guy. Basically, um, well, let's just go over here. I'm going to go to the, to the um, area. Uh, let's go to the CQ tools and uh, let's get into the, uh, of course, oh, no, no, no. Let's go to the Chrome pass. Here we go. And what we see over here is the following. Yeah. So here we can see that uh, it's just like a Nearsoft uh, near, near tool, uh, which is a Chrome pass free tool, of course. And you are able to see that the user stored its password. Not a biggie. I mean, that's obvious, I would say. Now, the question is, how can we get access to that while having only access to the encrypted blob of that particular uh, browser? So let's see. So what I will do, um, and I'm going to use this offline, I'm going to do it offline for the clearer picture for the presentation uh, to make sure everything, everything is all clear and so on. So I'm going to, well, technically, let's just move forward, restart this box, and I'm going to get into the, uh, well, CD-DVD. Um, that's going to take a small moment, and on the top of that, I will uh, change the 
oh, here we go, uh, change the cache log on data. Uh, I'm going to use for that purpose uh, Mimikatz uh, with our module uh, for uh, changing cache log on data. I don't want to say cache credentials because they're not credentials um, uh, at the end. Uh, OK, so let's go to the repair mode. Fantastic. Troubleshoot. And then we go advanced options and to the very advanced command prompt. OK, and then basically, uh, let me just change a little bit of a font because, uh, yeah, that's unfortunately I have no impact for that. But I think uh, something like this will do. OK, so uh, here we go. Let's go to the D drive and CQ tools. And now we're going to change the cache log on data so that I can log on with the change password so that you will see that that password will not be visible anymore. Yeah. Uh, OK, so let's go into QE Secure Edition and uh, Mimikatz. Here we go. And then basically we're going to do uh, LSI dump cache. And then we're going to do D uh, Windows System32 config. I have to type, type it, unfortunately. And then system. Uh, because this is the place where the boot key is, uh, and the boot key, pretty much any type of a system secret, uh, is the one that is actually encrypting it. And now we're going to do D, uh, Windows, System32, uh, config, and then security. And this is the place where the cache logon data is, slash QE, to um, have it. I think we are all set. So that is positive. We have just overwritten cache logon data. And the very next step that we're going to do uh, and let me allow uh, doing it now. We will, at that certain moment, and I will do it on my side, change the network uh, to uh, technically not connected uh, so that we can aim, we are able to log on with the cache logon data. Okay, fine. Yeah, so this one is disconnected from the network. Fine, continue, and then we can move on. Now we're going to see if we are able to get access to the secrets or not. Yeah, And eventually who is able to get access to those. Yeah, So this is this is, um, this is a little bit of a... Uh, set up. Uh, okay, it, the reboot is really fast, so um, there shouldn't be a problem about this. Perfect. I would like to log on to this box with the password that I used before, which is a p at ssw0rd. Yeah, and that doesn't work. But this time I'm going to type mimikatz. Yeah, why not? And uh, I'm logging on with the overwritten cache log on data. This is a domain user. That's not that much of a big thing as long as we know how the cache log on data algorithm works. So we are able to pregenerate our value, cracking it, not really, overriding always, yeah? Okay, so we've got this. Now let's have a look at what we got with the uh, Chrome Pass and et cetera, yeah? So um, question is, of course, what's happening? So now we are trying to decrypt with the current user's password hash all the different types of master keys that are out there and trying, 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 and at the end, it will tell us that unfortunately it's not able to, to do that, and that's, quite interesting situation, as we see, because that proves the point that it's not prone to um, offline access. And uh, when someone is trying to reset our password, this person will be able to access to log on, but not accessing our secrets. Fine. Let's dig in into the problem. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here. Yeah? Uh, so the problem looks like this. Data Protection API uh, with the Active Directory uh, works in a way that Technically, um, there is a, this very specific public key, and of course, it's there by the reason, yes? So that particular public key can be used by several types of operations by the domain controller, but in general, that decryption technique by the private key that is in the memory of the domain controller looks in the following way. So the client makes an RPC call to the domain, and then basically what domain does, domain controller does, it returns the decrypted master key which client can use to decrypt all the different types of secrets. We can do it online, but we can do it also offline. I think offline is more juicy because you are dealing with real data, not some kind of a software that is running in the back. So we're going to actually do that offline. Yeah? So uh, what is the situation? That in the domain controller, and uh, if we have a look at the right side, we do have over here, uh, well, Elsa's who obviously has access to that particular secret, but Elsas has the possibility to decrypt the key that is stored in an encrypted form in ntds.dit. And we've been searching for quite a long, like where this key could be and uh, et cetera, but every type of a key and also data protection API blob has its own pattern. So we found it and that one is called, of course, um, G dollar backup key. And then it has an identifier, this preferred specifies as an identifier. So that's the one that is currently used. There can be many, but that's the one that is actually currently used, yeah? 
So let's have a look further of uh, how we can extract it from the domain controller. And we could be thinking, okay, what about like hackers? Like, could they be like domain admins to do it? Well, yes, but I'm not saying that we have to be within the attack a domain admin. I'm saying that if you have a bad domain admin that uh, maybe nobody monitors, that will be definitely a person that is able to get access to every single secret of every person within the organization. And that's more of my point here. Um, okay, so let's have a look. First of all, what we would do, uh, we're gonna extract that particular key from the memory, yeah? And for that purpose, uh, we wrote a tool, and this one is called uh, CQ um, Elsa Secrets Dumper. And CQ Elsa Secrets Dumper has one parameter called file. And that particular file, so parameter file, let's do it, and we're gonna do export at PFX, we just give here a typo, we just give here a, give here a, num a, a name of the file, and that's pretty much it. So that exported PFX, has a certain type of um, uh, identifier, and that particular identifier uh, that is displayed on the screen, as you see, is the one that is preferred from AD. So this is also what you will find in the entity as did as a preferred key. So that's the one that is currently used. So if we do import this guy, uh, that's quite interesting. Password is small letters secure. Dang, 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 thank you. Cert mgr.msc, let's do it. And if we go to the personal, then you see this very interesting type of a certificate that if we have a closer look af at what's that, yes, then basically um, you can tell that it's a very interesting certificate that has like empty uh, to, empty by, and it's already invalid. That's not cool. Uh, why not? Well, do you have any impact on that? Answer is no. So if you generated your domain, if you set up your domain like in 2008 or something, this is the time when this was valid for one year up to 2009 and that's it. Yes, we've been to Redmond. Uh, in our team, we've got a group of MVPs. We travel there regularly, literally. And that is not something that is about to be changed shortly. Yeah. So uh, you like it or not, you have to live with this. So if we have a look at more details, then we can see over here that it's actually leveraging as well SHUA1. Not everybody will be happy probably about that, but in this area, I can tell you that it's not that bad. Could be worse. Uh, so uh, this one can be forgiven at some point, unless you've got some other standards. But uh, this is, uh, of course, a certificate that uh, we all have. And that private key that we have just exported will be the one to decrypt, of course, that particular value uh, that was um, on the client side over here, yeah, so let's work on that. So how that's gonna work? Well, that's gonna work in the following way. We need to open up the console as a regular user, and we need to find out the master key that is corresponding to that secret with the password of Chrome. How do we do that? Well, I will explain it verbally because otherwise it's gonna take some time. Uh, we've got a tool, it's called CQ DP API Blob Searcher. Uh, you take it and you run it on a certain folder you can run it on a whole C drive. By the way, it's a very interesting activity uh, to see how many secrets you've got in your windows. Yeah, uh, And uh, it lists us blobs. And if it lists, up, uh, lists a blob from the Chrome folder in a user's profile, I mean, obviously, that's the place. You take that blob, you drop it into some kind of a hex editor, and at the very beginning, not that very beginning, but a little bit uh, farther down, you will be able to see the identifier of the master key. This is how you do it. So that's really the only way that we found out. So uh, I already know which one that would be, uh, but uh, let's have a look at the further different steps. So that particular secret is supposed to be decrypted with this private key on the DC's memory, encrypted with my current password hash. All right, why like that? Because Data Protection API cannot understand the clear text data. So I have to encrypt it additionally so the data protection API says, oh, that's my user's password hash. Let me grab it. Oh, okay, this is how it's uh, how the secret looks like. So let's get into that flow. Yeah. So we're gonna get into CQ tools, data protection API. And over here, first of all, what we will need to do, we will need to generate the hash of the current password. All right, so that's gonna be used for the encryption. So my current password is Mimikans and user it's not prone to the username, but our tool requires that. And that is the current password hash. Okay, MD4, perfect. So this is the first parameter that we will need. Another one, 
uh, we're going to use over here a tool as another tool. That tool actually consists of a 41 different little tiny tools that we've been working on, but it's very simple to be used right now. It leverages three parameters. One, it's the PFX, check. We have this second new passwords hash, check. We have this. Another one is the master key that we will need to use to decrypt it. And that, that one we don't have yet, but that is quite easy. So we're going to do it like this. Um, master key AD, here we go. Then we're going to do new hash. And uh, I'm going to just put in what I've got. It doesn't have to be in the order. PFX, another one. And I have over here uh, that PFX. And then we've got file. And that file I will need to grab from the user's profile. Yeah. So let's see where that, that stuff's going to be. Uh, I'm going to technically do percent up data percent. Here we go. And then we're going to go to uh, Microsoft Protect. Uh, and uh, of course, we're going to get into sit of the user, bring it on. And then we're going to find out our key. Yeah. So our key uh, should be somewhere. Let's just go page down, page down. Here we go. That will be this one. I have it marked, as you see, by the other key. And I'm going to shift right click, copy as path and we have it here, file, paste. So what happens is that this generates an, us another new uh, type of a key. Let me just go to the bottom, this one, AD modified. And this is something that we're going we're gonna to rename, yes? But before we do that, that guy needs to be gone. So let me just rename it. Mm. <laughs> uh, good. There we go. Yeah, we can leave it this way. And that guy, AD modified, let's just do that, rename, here we go. Okay, fine. Yep, and uh, well, what's going to happen over here is that I will need to change here an attribute for the system and hidden. Yeah, that is basically the flow. So let's just copy that, paste, enter. And for now on, we're able, hopefully, hopefully, I'll just F5, yep, to see the password of that particular user, yeah? So what just happened um, to, to explain is that we have, by extracting some information from the Active Directory, which is the private key corresponding to that public key that encrypts everybody's secrets within the domain, managed to decrypt a secret of the user. What's the conclusion? Conclusion is that, A, for the local users, our secrets are as protected as our password strength is. For the domain users, our secrets are protected as our password strength is and as our domain admin is, so to say. Uh, which means if you have access to the domain admin's accounts, you have a power, and we all know that, but yet that's just another reason for protecting a pretty nice uh, server type. And the second thing is that domain admins, uh, in general, we all know that they should be logging on only to the domain controllers if there should be, in general, out there, Maybe they should be basically uh, just password generated, stored in a safe somewhere, and nobody really leverages these accounts. And if it's about the domain controller's backup and access to the offline data of the domain controller, ntds.dit, and that's not cool, uh, is accessible by the boot key, which is in a system hive. So basically, if you want to decrypt the hashes of all of the users uh, from the domain, then you can still do it by, of course, having an offline access to the domain. And this would be also possible to decrypt this backup private key that I was showing during the presentation. So how the domain controller's protection should look like, there are a couple of things to be applied. Offline protection, that's definitely a must. Controlling of who is logging on and what kind of users do you have operating in your infrastructure. In general, code execution prevention, preventing, performing the memory dump, etc. And these are the three major steps that will, hopefully, keep your domain controller uh, untouched so that nobody is able to extract that kind of a data. Uh, cool. So uh, with this positive accent, let's move to the next part, uh, which is, uh, can we go like farther than that? Can we do a little bit of a bigger massacre? Yes, of course. And uh, I will explain as well how we are able to secure from that. Yeah. So um, what else can we extract, so to say, while we have these kind of accesses? Well, yeah, we could say like everything that is really encrypted this way. Yes, but I would like to show you this, okay? So that's going to be the flow. So that's another machine. 
that I have when uh, I found out that the user basically has a possibility, uh, has, a, has a key pass, yeah? And I would like to get access to the key pass of the user, yeah? How can we do that? Well, if the user is just protecting key pass with a password, which I believe most of you do, uh, then, well, you can torture a person, that would be pretty much the only way I would believe, but it, in the other case, if the user is actually relying on the single sign on for Windows, then that's a good message for you because then you were like, great, then data protection API comes to place. Just another secret. Let's move forward. So what I have over here is I do have over here the CQ base. That's the database of the user. What I will do over here, I will type the password that I will type in later so that you see that right now it doesn't work. It's a secure, uh, it's small letters, enter, and as you see, I'm not getting access to it. But what I've got access to, it's the master keys of the users that I'm able to decrypt because I have this PFX. I already showed you this operation, so now I'm gonna shorten it a little bit. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, so as you see, that doesn't work. I'm gonna take this master key in the clear text of the user. So this is the one. And I will work on the KeePass database. Now, KeePass database works in the following way. Yeah. So here we've got, um, well, as you see, um, let me check, uh, not the backup, no, no. Oh, sorry, not my, my fault, my fault. Let me show this to you again so that we got it. I just want to use this folder. As you see, uh, that's the same. It's the same type of a file. Oh, here we go, that's better. So over here, we've got a protected user key bin and that's the pure data protection API blob. So that blob is decryptable by the master key that I have. That blob will give me the key and that key will be able to get access to that database. That's how it works for KeePass. That's how it works for LastPass and any other type of a credential manager type of a solution. So what we're going to do now, uh, let's get into analysis or eventually uh, we got also tools and within our tools, uh, we've, we're going to be using two tools over here for real. One's going to be the and we have a horrible name, so sorry about this. CQDP API, uh, whatever, keep us DB decryptor, yeah? And uh, CQDP API blob decryptor, so these two. Uh, I'm gonna use the first one uh, first uh, to decrypt that uh, protected user key bin file that keep us leverages. But uh, first, before I need to do that, that file itself, it's not only encrypted with my master key, it's also encrypted with the entropy. Remember at the very beginning, we said that Data Protection API Classic sometimes can use entropy. Entropy is a little funny if you have access to the machine because entropy is saved always in a form or of a clear text for this kind of solutions. So whether I like read it from the tool, from registry, et cetera, then I mean, it, it, it makes things complex, but only if you're dealing with a pure data. But if you have a context, uh, it's just not, not a complexity over here. So uh, let's just move forward. So we're gonna do CQ, uh, let me just enter, here we go. CQ Data Protection API. Let me just enlarge this, okay, better. Data Protection API blob decryptor. That takes as a parameter master key, I have that. Entropy, I don't have that. And blob, I have that. Okay, so let's get the entropy first. CQ, and that's another tool, keep us DB decryptor. And this gives us an entropy over here. Yes, this is an entropy of keep us. Fine, so what I can do, CQ data protection API blob decryptor master. And I have it because I already uh, copied that. Fantastic. Then entropy. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me take this, enter, fine. And uh, we're gonna specify over here uh, another part, which is uh, of course uh, the blob, yeah? And our blob is in the C, analysis, and the protected user key bin, fine. Yep, great. So what happened is that we have right now that decrypted uh, the key that is used to encrypt the key pass database, yeah? So here we go. Uh, next stage, the very last stage, is to CQ, and then we're gonna do the, our key pass, DB decryptor, and that takes two parameters, key, which we already have, and the file, which we already have because it's our key pass database, yeah? So let's move forward, K for key, and then paste, and then we've got file, and then we're gonna do C, analysis, and this is our CQ base one KDBX. Perfect, that changed it to CQ base one, so let's have a look of what we got. And uh, we've got the CQ base, enter. So it opens up that, and if I try to 
type the password secure again because we were encrypted then basically we're able to get access to the key pass yeah so this is the power of having the full data protection api platform reverse engineered any type of a secret really that you save that is saved by using the windows platform is pretty much decryptable this way yeah by especially by the domain admin now we could just play even more yeah so technically if we do have this particular uh, master key uh, which we had uh, in the text file over here then uh, we could get access to not this one we could get access to um, well all of this type of secrets i have for you just another example just to give you the background that is uh, is working uh, for the remote desktop connections part uh, and uh, if we get into tools then uh, i've got over here another one which is related with the rdc uh, so the or RDP or RDC for the massive um, bl blob uh, files. Yes. Yeah? So let's just get into the RDC. Here we go. This is this one, and it takes file and master. So not a big deal. We can technically use that master, and then we specify that we paste it, and then we do file as well, and then we do C analysis. Here we go, and then we specify, of course, our uh, secure connections, and then these connections are. They can take and contain saved username and password. So if you do use RDC a connection manager, yes, then basically all these passwords they are decryptable. Just know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is this is this part. Yeah. Now question is: Is there any other place where the data protection API works? <laughs> of course, um, we've got users related data protection API classic, but we've got also system ones, and that's cool. System meaning every single thing that you save within the operating system as a secret is decryptable by yourself and it's also prone this time to offline access so if you have access to the disk so to say then you are able to decrypt all these different types of values and there are so many places where the data protection api system is actually working let me show you how you are able to leverage that by for example getting into uh, such a simple thing like uh let's say iis yeah so that's going to be the that's going to be the flow so what we're going to do this time so what i have uh and i'm gonna let's just get into the full screen what i have over here it's the script that i'm going to use in a second that is allowing me to extract the value from the registry that IIS uses uh, for the centralized certificate store. But first, context is missing. Yes, yeah? so let's dig in. Uh, so within the IIS, uh, what is nice is that since IIS 8, what you've got, it's the possibility to configure centralized certificates. Yeah, these guys. Now, centralized certificates are quite cool because you are able to uh, well, update all the PFXs within a one central location, and then you don't need to import them in the personal container of the server. There are pros and cons for that, so don't get me wrong. Uh, one of the things that are not that cool is that if you do configure those, so I edit feature settings, you probably already noticed that I didn't select any of those certificates on the left, in the left top corner. Um, I didn't. And I have here in the bottom the possibility to configure the password for the private key. What does it mean? What's the problem? The password is the same. Yeah, that's the thing. So you could be like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I have like 100 HTTPS websites. Does it mean that all of these PFXs have to have the same password? Yes. So you choose, okay? Uh, no comments on that. So um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna update the password, whatever. So I'm just gonna specify some kind of a password. That, and that's really dodgy in IIS. I love IIS, don't get me wrong, I really do. But that thing is weird. IIS always stores settings in the configuration files. Yeah? It used to be like that historically. You've got, uh, right now, application host config, you've got web config, you've got machine uh, config, etc. So it's config, config, config. But then, ding, suddenly, um, this value actually goes to registry. <laughs> so um, I don't know why, but uh, this is how it is. So, okay, that value has been updated. Now, the question is, how can we leverage this so that value within the registry is actually within the local machine so we can get there get, get particularly there so uh, we can get into the local machine uh, of course and uh, we can get into software and uh, then we can get into Microsoft uh, and we can get into uh, IIS here we go and we can get into central third provider and basically what you will see think yes is that they are the values that we are looking for 
these are the ones, especially the one second from the bottom. It says private key password. Nice. Looks like base64, smells like base64. It's not a base64. Well, it is, but underneath there is a key that is encrypted and they chose this way to save it because base64 is absolutely smooth if it's about processing it through different types of uh, tools. Yeah. So uh, what are we going to do? We're going to take this value and we'll try to decrypt it. Now, with what keys and how? Well, if we do look at the architecture of the IIS, and let me technically get into that area for the moment, uh, then it's quite clear who would know where the password is. So we've got user mode and kernel mode, putting this in a very schematic way, HTTP.sys, and we've got SVC host. SVC host consists of two services, World Wide Web Publishing Service and Windows Process Activation Service. Both of them, they run as local system. I mean, it's just a one instant of SVC host that runs as local system. And any type of configuration, like for example, in this case, application host config file, it's read by that guy. And we're not storing that password in a clear text, as you see. So if that guy reads it, this guy needs to also have keys to decrypt it. So who do we need to talk to in order to fetch that type of information? Azure is local system and local systems profile. Now, IIS, as I already mentioned, is a little weird. So we could go to the local systems profile or we could ask IIS and say, hey, give me the keys from the container that you manage. It's a little virtual saying because for real, I mean, you can go to the folder and grab them from there, but it's more romantic to do it this way. So why don't we just do it this way? So uh, here we go. We've got, uh, of course, that credentials or whatever that was secret loaded, and we are leveraging that within the worker process file. So it has to know it, that's the flow. Now, IIS, just to give you the background, uses lots of different types of providers, especially within the IIS 10, there are a couple of new ones. Yeah. So the new ones is the IIS Windows Activation Service only CNG provider and IIS CNG provider. And there are also a couple of other ones that you can use. Yeah. So these are the providers that you as a developer ask in order to perform for you some cryptographic uh, operation. Yeah. Uh, let's dig in into how we are able to export import those keys and how we are able to leverage those keys in order to uh, decrypt, of course, all that type of a content. Lovely, so let's do that. In order to be able to get access to the IIS keys, there is a very weird tool, uh, which is built in a Windows, by the way, uh, which is worth having a look at. And this is basically Windows System 32, INET SRV. And uh, we've got over here, uh, no, sorry, my mistake, not in this place, uh, <laughs> Microsoft.NET. Here we go. Uh, I know the service is going to be in a second. Uh, we've got Microsoft.NET. Then we specify, of course, um, the framework, framework 64. Then we specify the version of the framework, bring it on. And there's, this is where this tool is. This is ASP.NET underscore rec IAS. Some of you may already know it, but it has the option. It has many options actually to uh, allow us to not only install ASP.NET, which is commonly used by developers, but from the IT Pro perspective, it has a possibility to encrypt some configuration sections, work on the keys, etc. It's a pretty good tool. One of the mistakes, by the way, when we were migrating the server, what we see at the customer side is to forget about the extracting the keys. And then we have to re-enter these passwords again. No, you don't, if you take the keys with you. Now, how do we work on the keys? We have to export them to be able to work on them. Yeah. So let's do that. For that purpose, we're going to use the option PX. Let me enlarge it again. So there is this um, two, 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 second from the top and it says export an RSC keeper and uh, to the XML, blah, 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 minus pry for the private keys. Fantastic. Let's do that. Uh, and we're going to, of course, use that, that particular uh, setup here. And we have to specify the container and the file. What is the container? That's this virtual part of the IIS that is romantic. And uh, we do it this way. So we specify uh, ISP.NET rec IIS, and then we do PX. Then we specify the container. And the container is called IIS was key. IIS Windows Activation Service key. By the way, that's kind of funny because it kind of proves that some people are hungry because Windows Activation Service, there is no such a thing. There's a Windows Process Activation Service, but P is missing. Uh, so uh, if you just need to, again, live with that uh, fact. Uh, in the registry, it has a shortcut WAS, but for real, it's called Windows Process Activation Service. Okay, so we've got this. Now we're going to do C test um, dot XML like this. And as we see, 
we managed to get access to that part. Yeah, so succeeded. Fantastic. Um, and uh, we got a C test XML. Great, great. So these keys are there. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to leverage these keys yeah, within our PowerShell script. Uh, when we've got, uh, first of all, we load it. Second, we specify what kind of provider is used by the IS. And for that area, there is an RSA crypto service provider used. And then, of course, we uh, leverage that by our, by our key. Yeah? Now, we read the value from the registry. So uh, this is this is the flow. Second, uh, we do uh, eventually use it and save it within the byte array. And another part, uh, if you are interested, we can display that how it looks like after the decryption, uh, after after base sixty four, so to say. And uh, it looks like uh, far east, but uh, but it's not. It's just an encoding, of course. Uh, and if we move forward, what we what we need to do is this. And I can tell you that is a little bit of a joke. Because this is why I showed the sandwich at the very beginning, yes? How do you know that you're supposed to revert it? You don't. And we didn't too. And we were fighting like for it. And then it's just not happening. But unfortunately, there is a one thing that differs Windows from Linux. Uh, is that there is no standard on saving data. Whether you use little endian or big endian, like from left to right, right to left or whatever. I mean, it really depends on the who is writing that piece of code. So if you are performing the reverse engineering in crypto in Windows and you have like 20 levels to pass and each of those needs to be checked from right to left and left to right, etc. Maybe not that blindly, but sometimes you just don't know. So you have to do that. Then it's a little bit of a freaky situation. So in this particular situation, that is the point that, yep, yeah, this time someone decided to write it this way. Yeah, because what it was Friday. Yeah. So uh, here we go. We have to revert it. And uh, of course, at the very end, we are trying to leverage the data protection API system. So uh, once and since we have, of course, all the type of information over here, um, that uh, is these keys, etc., then basically, as you see, we are able to uh, get access to this password. Yeah. So this is stored basically in the registry in the encrypted form, encrypted by the master keys of a system, a local system. And because you have access to keys of local system, you are able to get access to those. Now, who encrypts, by the way, keys of a local system? That's a question. And this is something that I would like to sum up, if you don't mind, for the system uh, part of the Data Protection API. Uh, and who has access to those? Answer is very straightforward. Yep. All of the Data Protection API system part is encrypted and it depends on the boot key. Boot key is like a graal to everything system related. And that boot key decrypts something that we call a machine ACC. That's the blue part in the bottom. Machine ACC, it's nothing but a local systems password, which is the same as the machine account password. So when the computer logs onto the domain, it logs on with the computer name and the password of the local system, which is its own password. Yeah. So that password, since you have access to it, you're able to leverage to decrypt all of the different types of master keys that are stored within the profile of the local system. What's the conclusion? Every system secret is yours. Very easily, online, offline, however you want. So just be aware that every single thing you store as a password, it's out there to be decryptable. Um, there is, uh, of course, TDE encryption within the SQL Server. Uh, and uh, this is something that we reverse engineered. Maybe, maybe next year uh, we will see each other over here and uh, who knows, maybe you would like to listen more about the SQL Server data encryption. Uh, we have fully reverse engineered that and it also relies on a data protection API, not a biggie. Uh, and anything really that is a system secret is to be if you, of course, have access to that particular box. Now, summing it up as far, uh, was to summarize, so this green and the purple, uh, hopefully, and the black area, it, this, these are the other secrets of data protection API system. So some database entities do that, that's clear, we already discussed that. As long as you've got a boot key, which is in a system hive in the registry, you're able to decrypt those. And also LSA um, secrets, this is a service accounts password, quite easy. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, I would... Uh, it, this is too easy to show at this conference, I'm sorry. You have to check out the blog, there's a video. If you type um, service in my blog, then there's a video how I'm doing this, easy part. Now, cache log on data, it's out there as well. Okay guys, so what's next? Closely, closely, 
we're getting to a very interesting scenario, which is related with the encryption of the PFXs, PFX files. And that is a new shade on the Data Protection API, which is uh, Data Protection API NG. So new generation, the one that has been introduced in Windows 8.1 2012 R2. Is it used all over the place? No, 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 just for a couple of things. So we still use both of them. And Data Protection API Classic is actually the number one. The NG we use in the major three areas. BitLocker, DPAPI, NG protected drive, which we already managed to get access to. Um, SIT protected PFX files, which is a fantastic feature because passwords for, 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 for PFXs, I think someone should go to hell for that because like, how, how do you manage passwords for PFX files? There are so many of them, yes, uh, for different areas. So finally, we are able to SIT protect them, great. This one, I will show you how to get access to that. And also ASP.NET Core by developers, yeah? So what you see right now on the screen is the ASN format, ASN blob of the PFX file that is SIT protected. Now, if you drop it into any type of an editor, this is an ASN editor, uh, simply speaking, you will be able to see that not only we are able to see the blobs, but we are also able to see the SIDs of the user. And it's not just SID that we rely on. No, no, we rely on a couple of more things, but this is something to be shown during the demonstration. So let me do that part. So uh, whenever we are thinking about SID protected PFX files, I'm gonna leverage for that purpose Windows 8.1, of course, why not? And I'm gonna log on as the user. Yeah, it could be Freddy. Perfect. So what's happening over here is, I've got a certain type of certificate and I can do uh, technically export. So let's just do that. Next. Uh, nope, sorry, sorry. We have to export it with the private key, obviously. Uh, by the way, it has to be made as uh, exportable. Uh, and, um, well, what to say, uh, at that certain moment, uh, you can also extract the not exportable private key from the memory. That's the subject for another presentation. Yeah? So here, what we will do, we will specify that we would like to give access to Blee. Uh, and uh, next, let's move forward. And we're gonna save it as a Blee certificate. Yeah, so this will be the file that we got over here. Okay, fine. Yeah, so we have targeted that to that particular user. Okay, now if I open this up, Next, next, that shows me this kind of like string here, yeah? And this is something that I would like to show you how we are eventually able to uh, get access to this particular data, yeah? So let's see very quickly at how that particular PFX can be accessed by our, our files. And for that purpose, um, I'm copying this file out. So this, there is this Blee certificate on my box and I'm gonna use the local tools to leverage this particular part. What we will need to grab for the accessing this particular PFX, it's the boot key from the DC, and the boot key from the DC, uh, I'm able to extract by using um, a simple tool, uh, either one, I mean, you can just grab it by any type of a tool, but we wrote a tool for that, which is called a CQ Data Protection, a CQ, CQ Secrets Dumper. So let me just mark this guy. Here we go, I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna put it into Notepad on my site. Uh, so this one goes out. And we are ready to rock with the getting access to this particular file, yeah? So uh, let me just bring this up to the field and we have it. So console needs to be running. Fantastic. And that works this way. Yes. So um, Data Protection API leverages the KDS keys, Kerberos keys. These are generated at the first moment you leverage Data Protection API and G. Uh, for example, group managed service accounts as well. So first of all, in order to be able to do that, we have to the, the get these keys. And this is to be done by leveraging one of our tools. And let me just show you, I have it already here. Um, I will just type it uh, there, NTDS, no, 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 like this, there, NTDS, here we go. And that's gonna be our decryptor, yes? So CQ NTDS decryptor, which takes parameters. So one of them is a boot key, and another one is the uh, file, and uh, um, which is the NTDS.dit and the KDS key, yeah? So we're almost done. So we've got NTDS decryptor, boot key, and then we paste it. Let me just do it, Control A, Control C. Fine, fine, here we go. 
Then we do file, which is ntds.dit, out file, which is hashes.txt, pfx, which is exp.pfx, and kds root key, which is kds.bin. Enter. Okay. And after the moment, so this particular key is the one that we are leveraging to decrypt the pfx file. Oh, not the whole, not actually, we will need this bigger part. Here we go. And let's get into uh, the decryption. So this is the last operation. Perfect. Where we're going to leverage the CQDP API and so on pfx decryptor, which takes pfx and the master key. And we have both. So let's just rerun it. And we specify over here pfx. And this was our BLE certificate. And then we specify over here um, the master, which is, of course, the copy of the key that we made. And as you see, it says successfully decrypted the password, which starts with the, what is this, uh, like C, T, N, S, something, something. And if we compare that with the machine that was out there, just to show you that it's actually the same one, then basically uh, we can enlarge this. And then this is the same password at the very beginning that we had. So this is how you get access to the PFX files that are data protection API encrypted. Okay, guys. So, hoo -hoo. this is the toolkit. Yes, um, it's even more in progress right now. Uh, you will find more information about the tools, etc., on our blog, which is secureacademy.com. You have it in the bottom. This is our educational part. And uh, there's also a quiz if you want to challenge our team on security. It's no registration, nothing, just pure fun. And at the very end, just to sum up, your data protection API, your secrets are as safe as your password is, as your domain admin is. But in the case of a data protection API system, it's as safe as your computer disk is. And when during this presentation, what you learned are different scopes of how Windows secrets are protected. It's not a bad mechanism, as you see. It just relies on a couple of components which we need to be aware of. Now you make a decision if you would like to share that secrets with Windows, domain admin, etc. on the standalone computer, as I already mentioned, is as safe as your password is. So if your computer is not a member of the domain, it's not that bad. Hopefully you enjoy the presentation. If you have more questions, uh, please, of course, feel free to uh, contact myself or our team. And uh, thank you so much once again for coming. And uh, yep, hopefully see you here for questions or for the next part. Yeah, thank you so much.